Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to our uh, fifth and final day of uh, the PyData Festival in Amsterdam 2020. Um, this talk this evening is all about applications in the world of Python and data science. And first, I would like to give the floor to uh, Bertjan and Huyp from Big Data Republic, who are going to take us, take us through yeah, exploring real-way oriented programming in Python, um, which I'm very curious about. So well, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is real-way oriented programming. Um, well, we will basically dive into a talk we've seen a few weeks ago, which is very interesting. Um, my name is Hype Gaming. I'm a data scientist at BDR. And my name is Benjamin Luxma, and I work as a data engineer also for BDR. Um, yeah, so at BDR, we have a lot of people who are very into functional programming. If you talk to them, they will start throwing weird names around, like monads, like categories, like endofunctors, like functors, like, and the mind just boggles. I mean, um, if, you, if you talk to these people, you'll soon realize you have no clue what you're talking about, and you really don't know what they are talking about. Um, but what really uh, st uh, struck me when I watched the talk was that functional programming is not as hard as they make it out to be. With they, I mean the people who have to talk about the, 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 the concepts as they are presented. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to walk through uh, an important concept in functional programming, um, and we're going to present it in a different way. We're going to present it in a real way oriented way instead of the functional programming with the linga. And we're going to do all this in Python. Um, so first, let's take a step back. Um, what actually happened was that Berjan um, challenged me in a way. He, he watched this talk and he thought it was very interesting. Um, and he I, said, I, you're way too kind for me. We were <laughs> fighting each other. We were fighting each other. Oh, sure. Um, we were fighting each other. Uh, I was saying, no, functional programming is stupid. Berjan was saying, no, it's awesome. Watch the talk. You'll be convinced. Um, because what he said in his talk was basically that the, fun, the, 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 the talk is, is focused on, on F sharp, um, but he said you can do this in any language. So the, the challenge was, let's watch the talk, let's re-implement most of the, 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 the blocks he, he, he talked about in Python, let's see what, what happens, basically. Um, so we, we did. We watched the talk, we uh, coded a lot of examples, we uh, looked what happened. And the bet was, if I have to Shastek, we're going to print with PyData. And here we are. Yeah. <laughs> um, so any um, presentation like this should really focus on what kind of application are we going to build. And this is not really a data science driven application that we're going to build. This is more of a web app type deal. Um, but the concept still relates very well to data science as well. So what are we going to do? We're going to have an, a use case, which is just updating a user record. Um, so we have a user. They make a request to our API or something. Um, <clears throat> we receive the re request. We validate it. We make sure that the email is valid um, and that it's in a format that we can understand. We update the record in the, in the database. We send an email, and then we re return some result to the user. So how would this look like in traditional Python? Um, if I if I were to build this application from scratch and I would just be uh, half an hour after that, I, I would have something that resembles this, right? I mean, first of all, I would validate re the request. <clears throat> I would do some uh, lower casing, some can canonicalization, um, update the database, send an email, and return something. And this is all well and good, but what could possibly go wrong? Um, we have a few calls that um, could possibly return an error or could reserve um, throw an exception or basically throw, do something that's not uh, intended in this case. Um, so we have three basic points where this could, could happen. First, on the validate step. Um, what could happen is that the validation could be incorrect. For instance, someone sent an invalid email address. The update of the database could fail. Uh, the database could be down. Uh, the user record could not be found, anything. Um, or sending the email could, fa could fail. So what do you normally do? Uh, you um, <clears throat> use try accept, right? So you just try to validate. If you get a validation exception, you re return an error of some sort. Same with the update of the database. You check if the, the update has completed. If it has not, you re return another error. 
And with send email, of course, it's the same. You try to send the email. <clears throat> if the email server times out, you just say, yeah, timed out, something went wrong. Um, but what, what you see here is that our very nice, very simple code, just a few lines, has basically exploded, right? I mean, we've, we've gone from five or six lines to a lot. Um, it's not great. It's not terrible. I mean, the, the overall structure is still pretty good to read, but it has exploded a lot. And the reason for this is that we had to combine the business logic, or what to do, with the error handling logic, what to do if stuff fails. Um, and because we have to combine these two things, the code becomes much more convoluted, convoluted and much more difficult to read. Um, so what did the happy path look like again? We have four, five lines, four of which are just basic, do this, do that, do this, do that. Um, and to be honest, I would much rather, much rather write this kind of code than this kind of code, simply because it's easier to read, easier to write. So wouldn't you much rather just write the happy path? I know I would. Um, so that's one of the promises of functional programming, because if I use functional programming, I could write the entire business logic I wrote before uh, as a composition of these five functions um, and be done. Okay, sure, this is still the happy path. So if you look at this code, you'll see that there's no error handling uh, done in any way. Um, so what happens if a failure happens? Well, this is the same code, but now I've implemented failure error handling. So what you'll see is that nothing really changed. The whole promise of doing this function composition in the railway pattern that we're going to present today is that you can just write the code you're already writing, writing the happy paths, and deal with the errors in a nice way. Um, so, railway oriented programming. What what is it and how does it look? Let me take a first let's take a step back. <clears throat> what is a function? Um, a function is something that maps something to something else. So in this example, what you'll see is that we have an a function that maps an apple to a banana. Okay? Um, and what you can do is you can compose two functions. So what you can do is you can take a function A, you take a function B, and because in this case, function A produces a banana, you can use this banana that you, you get from function A, put it into function B, and get a pair. So that's what you see here. If you compose the functions, um, you, get, you get basically, uh, uh, how do you say it? A single track. A single track that goes from an apple to a banana and then to a pear. And this works because the signatures in between are uh, compatible, right? I mean, function A produces a banana, and function B accepts a banana. And the nice thing about this is that this track of functions, so the, the, the composition of function A and function B, is again a function. Um, and what's, what's nice to realize is that because this function maps to a banana inside, but maps to a, a pair on the outside, basically the function C that we created is now just a function that maps from an apple to a banana, or sorry, to a pair. So it is impossible to tell from the outside that this function is built from much smaller individual functions. Um, how would you do this in Python? Well, as you can see in, in, in the bottom, you just have function C, which is a composition, function A, and function B. Um, <clears throat> pretty straightforward-ish to write in Python. Um, <clears throat> you write a compose function. Um, you have to do some, some fun tools with, with reduce. But what this does, uh, if, you, if you call it with a, a bunch of functions, is that it just, uh, if you compose with function F1, F2, and F3, it will create a function that calls F3 over F2 over F1, which you then can call over any input you want. So that's good. But this is still the happy path. Um, we're, we haven't talked about errors. We haven't talked about any of that yet. So I'm going to give the floor to Berjan to explain that part. Thank you, Harp. So let's say we have parts, we have functions where something can go wrong. So how do we deal with this? Uh, one way of this would be throwing errors or exceptions, as we have seen before, but there is a different way which we want to present here. Instead of just returning a function, we we, we create a split in our track. Either something goes, goes, goes as we expect, and then we have success, or something goes wrong, and then we have, an, have a failure. 
This is very simple to implement. Let's look at the fail date function, which gets a request. A request gets in uh, if it is required. If, if the request is valid, we just wrap it in some kind of success class. And if it's not valid, we return a failure. And in this failure, we put whatever we want. In this, this, this case, a simple string telling something went wrong with the validation. The nice thing about this is that our validate function now always returns an output. If it's valid or not, uh, we get an output which we can deal with, even when things go wrong. Now, if we have two switches, we can start composing them again. So we have one function which produces either a success or a failure, and another one which also produces a success or failure, and we can compose two together. Uh, and in the case of a failure, we just bypass. How does that look like? Now we get a track like this, where on either part of our composition, uh, the function can go either on the green track, being a success, or on a failure track. And we can, of course, do this with multiple functions. So we validate, we update the database, send an email, we compose them all together, creating this long track where either everything goes right or at some point something goes wrong. But at the end of the track, we will get either a success or a failure, which you can deal with. So composing in practice, how does that look like? Uh, we can compose single track functions, no problem. As long as the, the output type of validate matches the, the, the input type of the update DB, DB, we can just compose two functions together as we saw before. The same goes for double track functions. As long as the output type of validate matches the input type of update DB, we can still compose two functions. However, we already saw that validate has a single track input and a double track output, while update DB has also a single track input. So how now can we compose those two? Because if we put a success in update DB, it will not know how to deal with that because it expects a request, not a success, and definitely not a failure. So for this, we need a bit of machinery. We sometimes we somehow need to lift update DB in, in a way such that it ex starts extract, uh, accepting double track inputs. How does that look like? We need an adapter for that. This this adapter is typically called bind, which accepts a function which which has a normal input, such as a request, but produces a two track output. As, uh, exactly as we saw with the update db function. The adapter creates a new function which accepts a double track. And this double track function checks the input. Is the success, then it will call the original function. And if it fails, if it, it gets a failure, it will, just, it will just pass on the input which it got. So now with this, with this bind function, we can adapt our update db function uh, by calling bind with this update db and create a new update db function which now accepts a double track input and produces double track output as well. So we basically lifted the uh, mismatch here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what happened is that this helper function we created here is the one which actually makes sure that we now accept a double track function. And that one is dealing with uh, with either the success case or with the failure case, as we saw. And in the failure case, it will not do anything. We will not call the original F function. It will just pass the input failure as an output of the, of the new F function. The important thing to realize is that this bind function is about shape. We want to go from pure values to wrapped values, wrapped in either a success or a failure. But it's not about the content. The content itself is, is still as is. Basically, you could consider uh, success and failure as cards running on this track, which is still carrying apples, bananas, and pears. Now that we have updated our function, uh, our update db function, we can actually combine them again. On the success track, we still go from an apple to banana to a pear. And on the failure track, we get whatever it's put out by one of those functions when it fails but it will not be modified by the functions afterwards anymore. So if the function A in this case fails, then the output of function B will be the failure of function A, as the result of function A just passes on the failure track 
straight on. But switches are not the only types of functions we want to compose. You also have canonicalize. This is a straightforward function. Nothing happens, nothing can go wrong. It will just take an input and, take, and produce an output. But this output is still single track output, producing a pure value, which, cannot, which we cannot compose with this updtb function. So here we need some additional machinery again. How does that look like? Well, it's almost similar to what we saw before. We need this additional track, which accepts a success or a failure, and in case of a failure, just passes on. Just ignore the canonicalized function in that case. Again, this is pretty straightforward to implement in Python. This, this function is typically called map. Again, we create an adapt function, which accepts a track, a two track in this case. And in the if the track is a success, then we we call this function on the value, which is in, in, our, in our success card, but then recall this um, canonicalized function and just re return a track, it returns a value. So we have to wrap the success of the function, uh, the value of the function also in a success. In case of an error or in case of a failure, then we just return the input track. And the whole map function then returns this adaptive function so that we now can um, so that we now can uh, compose, canonicalize, and update DB properly. But you might have seen that this already looks a bit familiar. This adapt track is basically borrowed from bind. And um, if you look at uh, success of f of track dot value, that's basically a composition of f and success. This means that we basically are reusing building, building blocks we've already seen before. So we can simplify the implementation of map greatly like this. We compose f and success and then bind this function in order to get the, the same result as we got before. And this is exactly the power of compositional programming. It greatly simplifies the, the structure of your program and, and therefore also makes it easier to reason about your program which I believe is awesome, and I think I convinced Hype a bit of this as well. So, we're almost there. Now that we all have all these components of all these building blocks, we can now build our full railroad. So we start with validate, which is now a function which produces a two-track output. We lift the talk canonical life function in such a way that it can deal with this two track input and produce two, two track output as well. If the request is canonicalized, we move it on to our update DB, DB dealing with the errors there. In the same way, we deal with errors and inputs in a sent email. And finally, we have this generate response function where we move our two track back to a one track function. Basically, this is the border of our domain, so to say. So now we have a centralized place where we can deal in, uh, in a domain-specific error, uh, in a domain-specific manner with the errors generated by any of the functions which came before. Meaning that the, central, that, that the error handling has become very centralized in this particular function, generate response, which should be easy to test and can be adapted to different, different domains if you reuse the pipeline before. So in the end, we end up with this. We have our business logic with error handling, which is a composition of a success, which is a simple wrapper class, because we need to wrap our pure, uh, pure request into a double track. Next, we lift our validate request into this double track. We map canonicalize to our double track structure and the same for update database and send email. And finally, we, we add the generate response to this. At this point, we have a piece of business logic which is able to deal with errors, while in the code you don't see this dealing with errors. 
Additionally, we don't have to deal with the um, input and output handling machinery anymore. As in, you don't see the output of one function being put in the other function. This is all hidden away. So we ended up with a quite nice um, piece of software, I would say, which deals with the business logic we want to deal with, deals with the errors as well, but is still very readable. Yeah, so right. we, we started off um, with a bit of a challenge where um, we would basically look what this would look like in Python, right? Um, and I think that what we can say is that we, we went from a situation where we had to mix the business logic with the error handle, handling logic, um, and by using this railroad type uh, uh, strategy, we've been able to move the error handling to the complete edge of the program and basically do it there. <clears throat> which means we don't we no longer have to mix the two um, which is nice in a way right I mean it's nice um, so Berjan asked me uh, before uh, we, we agreed to do this talk would I do this in practice um, and the answer to that is yes maybe no maybe yes maybe I don't know the reason for this is that um, there is not really a library that we found that really does all this stuff for you in an easy to read, easy to write way. Um, yes, there are libraries that very much look like the F-sharp implementation on the right, and just do the bind with a nice um, operator instead of doing all this bind and map manually. That's true. Um, but languages like F-sharp and Scala uh, also come with a lot of very nice features in terms of uh, compile time checking uh, and all that kind of stuff. And writing all that stuff in Python is possible, but it's a lot of work. And we haven't found anything that does this out of the box for you automatically. Um, so if this were if this were properly implemented in a library that, that had type in supports um, with composition time type checks, so that the time that you actually run the code um, to start up Unicorn or your uh, whatever, it would just tell you that some of your compositions are wrong. That would be very useful. That's not really present yet. Um, also, you need a very nice and polished API like you see in the right, because writing all this bind, map, compose, really does clutter up the, the, the code again. And it takes away from the very nice experience that you might have if you were to write in another language. So would I do it? Mm, maybe. We need, we need another session like this. We need another session like this to <laughs> to hash out these details. Yes. Um, and it's also good to note that we went through the concept very quickly today. We really, really hammered out the details so we could fit all this, all this information that we just saw in this talk, which was an hour long into 30 minutes. So we did skip a lot of corners. Um, if you think this is interesting, but you didn't understand anything we said, I completely understand. Um, look, at, look up the original talk. It's very I would say very fun to watch. It's very intuitive. The guy's a very good guy. Um, yeah, links in the slide. Links in the slide. Uh, and uh, for the so for the more advanced, uh, for the curious programs, I would say also look at, for example, PyMon and Noslash. They implement actually the underlying functional concepts of the thing we did just discussed during this talk, but use the functional lingo. Yeah. If you're fine with functional lingo, then go there. Um, I've, I've seen we have one question from the audience. Um, there is a lot of branching. Any thoughts on the kind of pro uh, performance trade-offs? Maybe there are certain class of programs where it works better than other approaches. Any thoughts? Uh, a lot of branching. Let's let's go to a slide where we here. Um, with respect to performance, I don't think there's an issue here because basically what happens in all of these functions is that as soon as we hit the, the failure track, function the, the value is just passed on. There are no function calls anymore. There will be just a function call from update DB, the actual function call, when you have success case from canonicalize. Well, that's always the case in this particular case. No, that's not always the case. If failure date fails, the value will just be passed on. It will just be simple. I don't see any performance hits there. No. Um, 
Yeah, it depends on the use case. If, of course, if you were to replace your NumPy code with this, then you would then I would say no. But if you were to just move from Python to this kind of Python, it doesn't really include any overhead. Yeah, sure, you have a bit of function calls, but I, I, I wouldn't. I don't see any real areas where there's a lot of overhead. To be honest. Um, okay. Uh, Different question is, so the main goal slash benefit of this is to have reusable blocks and centralized error handling. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, definitely that. Yeah. Uh, I think this is uh, one of the nice examples is this one. So here we basically implement the concept we were working on. So this real world concept, we are implementing map here. And when implementing map, we realize, hey, uh, this looks very familiar to us. We already had this adapt function. and a success of an F is basically a function composition. And when you realize these things, that, that your program is basically not more than um, uh, a composition of functions, you end up in one liners like this, where you can abstract away a lot of implementation details of how things are done by just composing function. And I, I believe that to be a very interesting way of programming, interesting way of constructing your programs as a great it has the opportunity to greatly reduce the number of lines you need to uh, achieve what would normally yeah, require much more lines of code. Yeah. Um, where do you see the difference to a promise implementation? To a promise implementation? Uh, what we've basically shown here is an either implementation and not a promise implementation. A promise is about uh, computation in the future, which will return a result in the future. That's a different concept, I would say. It has relationships to this, but um, not one which is easily explained in the same terms of a real world track. Um, how different is this from calling the error track exception in Python? Would this provide any guarantees you wouldn't get with procedural code with exceptions? Yeah, this is an interesting <laughs> question. We had this discussion over and over again between the two of us. Um, so as soon as you start throwing exceptions, you will lose the um, you will lose the benefits of the composition. Because then, if you assume that any function is a, can be a composition of other functions, but you also have to assume that any of those composed functions could throw an exception somewhere, then you always end up dealing with the return values, which can be either success or failure, but still also wrap it in, in a try except to deal with exceptions happening there. And um, well, I believe that dealing with values in the long term, it's easier to reason about, and that makes your uh, software more maintainable, so to say. And as an engineer, that's what I'm looking for, is my software maintainable or not. Uh, dealing with exceptions uh, is a possible way, and I know it's very common in, in, in Python, but I, I believe that the, the way we present this here is, is very doable as well, and has some long-term benefits, which, which we have seen in, in, in other languages as well. Okay, I believe that's, that's all the open questions we have. I think so too. Um, well, that's a nice presentation. Also very impressive to uh, fit a one hour idea <laughs> one hour presentation into half an hour. Um, I skipped a lot of details. <laughs> it's a, well, it's a nice overview how you can do a lot of flexible stuff with a small number of building blocks. So, uh, well, thank you very much for uh, this talk. And well, if there are any other questions, uh, you'll be available in the Discord. Yeah, definitely. Thank you very much for having us. Thanks for having us. And thanks for attending. Yeah. Well, thank you.